Okay, before I start, if you are an MBA student, please sign up here. Where are they all? No idea. Maybe they believed in the summer of one day that it's over. I thought it was when they were writing the MBA yeah, oh, okay. uh, exams that start on the 14th, but they're probably revising. Mm. Okay. okay. If the MA students are revising, maybe we should just get started. It's my great pleasure to welcome Guillermo Hoyer today, um, who is at UCL, where he is a Newton Fellow. Um, working on singing and forgetting also, I believe, among the Arabic kids, a group in Eastern Amazonia. And uh, today he will tell us about singing, hopefully also a bit about forgetting. <laughs> uh, in his talk, two songs for a red girl, music and language in Eastern Amazonia. And the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Uh, Thanks for the opportunity of being here. Thanks for coming. Um, I will, as we anthropologists do, read, uh, but I have a few slides as well. So I'll just, since we're a bit uh, delayed, I'll just <coughs> jump in and start. Can you can you hear me in this or do I need a microphone? I think it's fine. I can't hear you too well. Um, no? Should we maybe close the well, window? Well, I'm just having a here, so I realize my smells are coming. Okay, let me know. I've got what tears of it. One lazy afternoon in the Arawete village where I conducted most of my field work, I was lying in my hammock trying to organize my field notes when Kunin Pudin, my next door neighbor, came into the house and asked me if she could listen to some songs on my radio. While we sat there and listened to the words of a deceased woman sung through the voice of a shame, a young man arrived carrying his baby and joined us. A few minutes later, Kunin Pedin's grandmother came in to drink some of the coffee I had prepared. And when she was about to leave, her granddaughter told her about a part of that song in which the dead woman complained about her husband, who was still alive. The grandmother sat down to wait for it to come round. Soon after, another couple came by to drink some of my coffee and were also convinced by Kunin Pedin to wait and listen to the now almost famous bit of music. The seven of us sat there and waited for over an hour for the part in which a deceased wife complained that her husband was gossiping with other women. It was only one line which went, can you see that he is whispering in her ears? The audience laughed heartily and after a few more sips of coffee left. Kuni Pedin then, then turned off the radio, smiled at me and also left. Kunin Pedin literally translates as red girl. The Arawete are 500 maize cultivators and hunters that live in eastern Amazonia in seven villages in the Brazilian state of Pará. They have been in contact with Brazilian government representatives since the late 1970s and most of them currently speak Portuguese even though they only communicate with each other in Arawete, a Tupi Guarani language. I did 14 months of field work with the Arawete, mainly in the Paratatin village from 2013 to 2014, returning briefly in 2015 and last year. Due to the recent construction of the third largest hydroelectric dam in the world close to their territory, the Arawete livelihood is currently being threatened. And this paper is part of an effort in language documentation to which I hope to get some funding soon. Arawete music is primarily vocal, with rare instrumentals, and their songs are divided into two main genres, music of the enemies and music of the gods. While music of the enemies is linked to warfare, danced in a courtyard, and structured by specific formulaic expressions, music of the gods is linked to shamanism, presented but not danced in a courtyard, and structured through refrains. Moreover, Music of the Gods presents the words of deceased Arawete through the shaman's voice. A shaman travels to the land of the Mai, the gods with whom the dead live with and eventually turn into, and brings back one or more deceased relatives to sing among the living. In these songs, the dead describe their arrival in the Mai's domain and how they were treated by the gods, including how they were devoured by them, 
and then remade, taking new spouses and forming new families. Music of the Gods is by far the most important music genre in Arawete verbal art, if we consider the number of songs that are presented, recorded and reproduced. The, the two songs in which I focus today belong to the Music of the Gods poetic genre, although they, although they are quite unique. One of them is a spirit capturing song, in which the shaman searches the outskirts of the village at night to capture the Anin spirits, who are often responsible for deaths amongst the Arawete. This song, or rather speech song, will be my main focus today. The other one is a healing song, which are extremely rare amongst the Arawete. Although healing songs are quite common in South American shamanistic traditions, that is not the case for the Arawete, to whom shamanism is not first and foremost related to healing, but to singing. A shaman is, above all, a singer. What is important here is that these two songs the song that captures spirits and the one that, that heals lost souls are connected through the same event. Red Girl, my neighbor who loves listening to recordings of shamanic songs and with whom I started this talk, was pierced by a spirit's arrow, becoming gravely ill. Her blood started to coagulate around her stomach and dark blue patches of it became visible in her skin. In the following days, her illness became progressively worse and eventually she could not raise herself from her hammock because her soul or double had left, had left her body. The songs that I'm discussing today are directly associated with this sad event. In song one, her father set out to seek revenge against the Anin spirits that had shot arrows at his daughter. And in song two, her grandfather was responsible for bringing her other body, her soul, back to its connection with the living car carcass, thus restoring her health. First, I would like to say, for the record, that I am not a linguist. Uh, I'm an anthropologist, a social anthropologist, as we say, but one that has an interest in language, linguistics and linguistic anthropology. I will, however, quickly provide you with a snapshot of languages in Amazonia. Far from being a place in which languages and peoples uh, are, are just disappearing, the Amazonian indigenous population grow faster than the non-indigenous Brazilian population. And in the past 20 years, there has been a massive growth and development in the amount of linguistic and anthropological work in Amazonia. The more these languages are studied, the more it becomes clear that very few features can be thought of as typically Amazonian, and the region actually boasts incredible diversity in terms of linguistic structure. However, there are a few features that seem to be more frequently found in Amazonian languages than in other parts of the world, some of which are directly relevant to this talk. As many authors have emphasized, Indo-European languages frequently lack something that is very common in Amazonian languages, which is the grammatical need to specify where the information of a statement comes from, and sometimes to also qualify whether the source of information is reliable or not. I am referring to the concept of evidentiality, which has gained much attention recently. A second topic that has been the focus of some uh, linguist work in Amazonia is frustratives. Particles that qualify an activity that couldn't be completed as desired. Something desired but not achieved. Here is an example of how frustratives work in Arawete. After an evening meal, someone might recall what happened during the day or maybe what they heard from someone else. Sometimes what a person says is immediately retold by someone else, usually a close relative. In such interaction, the reteller of the report and the original utterer compose a dialogue that lasts for a few minutes. Every time a sentence is retold, the original utterer says, that is what I said, and adds a particle indicating that it, it, that it is what she wanted to say but didn't manage to. Uh, yeah, I just brought a few slides here, maybe a bit too much, but I'm talking about the Arawete. The Arawete is a Tupi it's from the Tupi Guarani language family. You can see the Tupi languages spread out uh, in, in yellow there. Um, I'm sorry? Oh, right, perfect, yes. 
Very clever. Да. There are eight subgroups in the Topigorani family. Subgroup five includes the Arawete, Kayabi, and the Shingu, uh, the Asurini Shingu, which you can see in black here. So this is the Kayabi, and over here, the Arawete and Asurini of Shingu. So this is the eastern portion of the Amazon. Yeah. There, uh, here, in orange, the, the green bit is the, what we call the legal Amazonia <coughs> in Brazil, and the orange bit is uh, the Araite territory. It's quite a substantial and very important territory for them, and it's about two and a half uh, million acres. So this, again, is the Araite territory. Some of the villages, or half of the villages, are in a small river over here, and three of them are on the banks of the Xingu River, which is one of the major rivers in the Amazon, flowing all the way over here to the Amazon River. And this is the city of Altamira, which hosts about 100,000 people now, and where they are still, or have finishing building, the Belomonchi Dam, the third largest dam in the world. This is the city to where the Areate go to every now and again. Um, and it, the construction of the dam has really affected their lives. This is the banks of the Shingu and the Paratatsin village where I, where I did my field work. And uh, the Arawete, we had just uh, finished building a canoe. Uh, but of course, as you can see, they, uh, um, they've been using, they've been piloting this river, learning how to pilot this river, live, river for the past 20 years, which they didn't before. Uh, this is Kuyana. Those are the earrings that they make. I'll come back to them later on. It's a young Aravate family. The clothes that they, that they, that they uh, weave. And this is how they wear those earrings here prepared for, for a ceremony. But it's quite usual to just uh, paint the faces with red urukum during the day as well. Uh, and this is Jacamituru singing. Solano, I'm sorry. Elizabeth Solano, Eliette Solano, the only linguist that has sufficiently worked with the Arate language so far, describes it as a nominative accusative language that uses morphological strategies of both suffixation and prefixation to agglutinate that relies heavily in co-referentiality and whose predicates are nominal in nature. Unfortunately, neither her nor other linguists who have briefly visited the Arawete have neither analyzed nor mentioned reported speech, notwithstanding its ubiquitous use in daily conversations and in specialized language such as songs. This topic, re reported speech, will be my main focus here today. The overall agreement among linguists uh, seems to be in Amazonia that, I'm sorry, that direct speech is the most common form of reporting, but some form of non-verbatim speech has been described for some languages. In his analysis of telling and retelling amongst the Kuna, Scherzer says reported speech can have baroque proportions when, for example, one Kuna is quoting his teacher, who is quoting his other teacher, who is quoting someone from a different indigenous group, who is quoting a chief of the spirit world, who is quoting God. All of this through embedded citations voiced in one single utterance. In another group, the Kalapalu, reported speech is more formal in narratives than in daily conversations, according to Ellen Bass. In these narratives, mythological quoted speech creates a monological understanding of a particular point of view. Quotes thus create a dialogue between points of view that identify a specific way of understanding the actions or a of a character or person. In other words, it introduces multiple voices to highlight one specific perspective. Most authors outside of Amazonia use the difference between direct and indirect speech as a tool to think about reported speech. Although Bakhtin, to which I will return on later on, makes a historical argument for the distinction between indirect and direct forms of reported speech, scholars, scholars frequently take the distinction itself as a given. Direct speech then, only, then becomes not only the arguable historical precursor of indirect speech, but also its logical point of departure. 
As Hasler argues, and I quote, the criterion for the bipartition of reported speech is the speaker's perspective. In indirect speech, the perspective of the speaker is maintained. In indirect speech, perspective and dexis switch to the positions of, of the reporter. That is why direct speech maintains the most important features of the original utterance, while indirect speech changes pronouns, tenses, datic elements, intonation, and even referential words. End of quote. One common assumption is that a citation is a phonological string that has no effect whatsoever on the behavior of the sentence in which it is inserted. For example, as you probably know more, very more than well than I do, formal semantics' premise is that embedded clauses are opaque. A quote and sentence is not syntactically or semantically a part of the sentence that contains it, as Donald Davison once argued. And the reference of indexicals comes from the context of utterance and does not rely or affect the context in which they are being reported um, or evaluated. However, linguists studying Romance languages discussed phenomena that were neither direct nor indirect speech as early as 1886. These phenomena were not verbatim citations, but they were not straightforward shiftings of the reference of the subject, time or place. They resembled mixed situations, which are hard to classify in terms of the dis distinction between direct and indirect speech. What I'm presenting here today reflects on some of these questions, the ultimate question being, what does it mean to use another's speech through our own voice? Anin are spirits that approach Arawete villages at night, roam furtively around their houses and hide behind banana trees from where they shoot arrows and try to pierce the Arawete. The shaman sees in his sleep that the spirits are approaching and on doing so, he leaves his house to catch them with his rattle and with the help of the gods. Moments before being killed, the captured spirit uttered its final words through the shaman's voice using intricate enunciations containing embedded quotes with comments about the Arawete and others. When this happens, you might hear a shaman voice a spirit quoting his grandfather saying that the gods are not actually gods. There is in these songs a clear and sharp distinction between two moments or blocks that are repeated as a set several times during the execution of these songs. In the first block, the shame, a shaman voices the spirits, and on the second block, he voices the gods. The spirits are voiced right after being captured and just before being killed, while the gods sing after each spirit's demise. Briefly, these spoken songs combine a spoken block and a sung block. One of the expressions that my Arawete interlocutors use to describe the spirits that speak in the first block is the ones who tickle us, who use their hands to make us laugh. The seeming lightness of this expression obscures the fact that these forest-dwelling beings are also called the ones who kill us. The Arawete's description of the Anin thus encapsulate an ambiguity between the shared sense of intimacy of a laugh and the disjunctive sense of alterity that death entails. The sound, this sound of intimacy and the sound of death, however, are not only descriptions, but also sounds the spirits make when they are captured by the Arawete. These spirits laugh before and after every sentence they speak, and they give a death cries when killed by the shaman's assistant. The god's block, in turn, is characterized by refrains. The use of refrain is characteristic of any song in which the gods are present. Uh, in which the gods are present, compared to the giggles and death cries of the spirit's block, the refrains frame the rhythm of the song. Laugh and refrains do similar things here. Before one even looks at what these speeches and songs are saying, these frames set a tone of, what, of whose words we will hear.
What I want to highlight here is that these two blocks are sung right after each other. Right? So it's the shame sermons, the shame sermon singing, the same shame that captured the spirits, that voices the Ani in this very fast speech, framed, as I kind of, uh, as I argue, between these two laughs, between, uh, I mean, before and after the sentence, while uh, in the Mize block, in the God's song, what frames the whole thing is the refrain. So it's this bit over here, which more often than not does not translate into anything uh, for the Arawete. And that usually goes after what's being said. So when a shaman goes out to capture the Anin, he roams through the entire village, passing between different houses to find them. The search occurs in silence and at a fast pace. While he walks, the shaman moves both his arms in a circular motion in front of him. In one of his hands, he carries a rattle, which he uses to capture them. It is only when he stops at a spot on the village boundary that he will voice them. The shaman surrounds the spirits and, and the gods hold them down until the shaman can throw them to the ground. The spirits are caught by surprise. They feel lost and ask for their bows and arrows. Where did they go? Where could Grandpa be? Where is Grandpa really? Where did they go, says Grandpa. There they are, says Grandpa. There's the bow. Where is my bow? Grandpa is over there again, and the jaguar is truly there. One spirit looks for his grandfather, who in turn asks and answers the whereabouts of someone while finding his bow. The spirit still can't find his bow, while his grandfather is already after someone that he describes as a jaguar. At this, at this point, it's still unclear what exactly the spirits are looking for and why they need their bows. It seems that they want to protect themselves from a nearby jaguar, which perhaps is a reference to the shaman and the gods who have come to capture them. Further speeches of different spirits throughout the evening will clarify what's happening here. The spirits have been surprised by what seems to be, to them, a group of wild pigs or peccaries, and they are scrambling for their weapons to hunt them. Other spirits mention the muddy pits where peccaries spend their time, comment on the beauty of these pigs, and how their fatness would make them a good roast. The hunt for peccaries is how the spirits see their relationship with the Arawete. They prey on them, make them victims of their weapons, and roast them for food. As I mentioned before, many deaths amongst the Arawete are attributed to these spirits and several of my interlocutors talked about the huge roasting grill that the spirits use to prepare, prepare Arawete meat. By presenting these ethnographic detail, details about the spirits, I uh, do not wish to bore, the, to bore you, but I want to highlight the idiom of hunting, capture and killing that surrounds the whole event. And I want to think if the capture of another's body is related to the capture of another's words if hunting pigs and capturing voices are somehow related. In other words, does the fact that spirits also speak changes the way in which we analyze reported speech? Can we rethink what it means to report another speech based on this idiom of predation that is inherent in the capture of spirits? Or conversely, can we completely separate linguistic structure from language ideology? As the night progresses, more and more spirits are captured but eventually what they say start to change. Instead of talking about the victims of their hunting parties, they start fearing and challenging the gods. Unlike the predator-prey asymmetry through which they conceptualize their relationship with the Arawete, they see themselves in this direct relationship with the gods. We need to stick together, says the spirit, or we will stink later. They don't like seeing us, the spirit says. And then he quotes his grandfather, who shouts, not people, referring to the gods. Here, the attitude has changed. The spirits need to stand up straight and stick together, or they will stink later. They will become rotten, rotten corpses. They are cautious because the gods don't like seeing them and would not hesitate to kill them. The spirit's grandfather, however, strikes a dissonant chord by saying that these armadillos are not people. 
According to my Arawetan interlocutors, he's referring to the gods and telling his grandchildren that the armadillo they see is not actually like them, it's not actually a person, and therefore it is permissible to kill it. As a difference, finally, sorry, the spirits mentioned that perhaps their grandfathers shouldn't say that, meaning that the gods won't like hearing that they're not people. The position, rather than the condition of being per a person, or being human, has been a central concern in recent ethnographies and theory about lo lowland South America. Several authors have posited that, judging by Amerindian understandings of what humans are capable of, the idea of humanity is not exclu exclusive to humans. Rather, it is a condition shared by animals, divinities, plants, spirits, and also indigenous people themselves. That is, humanity is a position that several beings can access, beings that Western metaphysics would label non-human. In these contexts, humanity appears to be not what one is, but a point of view that other beings have access to, where being human is a cultural capacity shared by humans and non-humans. As Viveiro de Castro suggests, Amerindian souls, be they human or animal, are thus indexical categories, whose analysis calls notes not so much for an animist psychology as for a theory of the sign, or a perspectival pragmatics. The spirit's grandfather, this grandfather's dissonant chord, then, is not ju as just a difference in opinion. They see the gods as celestial beings just like the Arawete shamans. As several Arawete uh, interlocutors explained to me, the spirit's grandfathers are not just from a different generation, not just grandfathers, there are also ritual specialists similar to an Arawete shaman. As Iravdo once told me, they can travel to the land of the gods and bring them to sing and eat among the living spirit. spirits. However, they also seem to challenge the gods by asking if they're actually people. The spirits call people pigs and try to hunt them with their bows and arrows, but the Arawete see, see them as spirits who can be captured by the shaman's rattle and killed with a machete. From each point of view, there's a different understanding of who are actually people, who is human and who spray. From the spirit's perspective, humans are ga game animals that can be hunted down. From the Arawete's perspective, the spirits must be caught and killed as if they were at war, that is, if they were all humans. As a result, what the Arawete perceive as warfare, the, the spirits see as hunting. We can see, I, I hope, that reported speech and then the Merindian notion of, of personhood are presented together in the capture of these spirits. A shaman voices them, gives them a platform, platform to speak, so to speak, and in this platform they challenge, the spirits challenge the, the Arawete's gods, the very beings that the Arawete will turn into. But the spirits are not only speaking what they themselves think, they're using reported speech to bring their grandfathers or their shaman's words into the scene. So let's have a closer look at how they do this. The Arawete language conveys reported speech either through quotative evidentials or through lexical verbs of saying. The quotatives are gram grammaticalized particles that do not resemble the verb of saying or are inflected only in self-quotation and only appear next to verbatim quotations. The forms that I've, I have recorded so far are iku, dare, I have it in a different order, and dao and they all have the same structure. A verbatim word or expression is followed by a quotative, which can be any of the forms mentioned, although iku is the common form, is the most common form. The quotative is followed by a free personal pronoun or someone's name, and there's an option at the end of including a reference to an object. In this example, uh, the expression I will go is followed by the quotative, and in this case, the pronoun wing, which can refer to any third person, singular or plural. Arawete vocal music frequently uses reported speech, a characteristic that these songs shared with daily conversational practices and with the telling of news from other villages and mythical narratives. In the capture of the spirits, this is quite clear in the spirit's speech, where a direct speech marker, or the direct speech marker, iku, is used to quote another speech, as in the following example from one of, of the speech presented earlier. This marker also makes it possible to place a citation inside another citation through its simple repetition. 
So not people equal my grandfather could be just added with said my grandfather, said him, said him, ad infinitum. The use of equal is characteristic of the spirit's speech, but this is not true for the second block of these songs, the block in which the gods sing. As I said earlier, the gods sing after the killing of every spirit. But the strategy of the gods to cite another speech is quite different. So let's see what happens in the gods block. The Mai are the Arawete's god or divinities, who once lived with them but have since then abandoned the Arawete to live in a celestial abode. Arawete shamans develop a relationship with the gods through the heavy use of tobacco, which transforms their body and makes, makes them visible to the gods. It is this relationship that enables them to bring the gods to help in the capture of the spirits, which they do by surrounding them from every side and allowing the shaman to encapsulate them in his rattle. Following the spirit's execution, the shaman crouches and the gods sing a short song. I will come later with the great, great Kochingas to the Mai's house. There the great Kochingas fly. There the great Kochingas fly. Are they talking to me? All these Kochingas together. All these Kochingas together. Oops, sorry. The Mai describe the landscape of the land. In this place, small Kochinga birds live in the canopy of immense trees that lie on both sides of a perfumed river. These birds are frequently called Kochinga feathers in a figure of speech that designates the bird by its feathers and at the same time hints at the fact that the gods, just like the Arawete, hunt these birds to make earrings. These items are hugely valued by the Arawete because they allowed them to become gods, another expression of the Arawete's continuous effort to link with their divinities. Here, however, the Kochinga birds are associated with the spirits and the gods comment briefly on the spirit's activities and intentions by asking, are they talking to me? After a different capture on the same evening, the gods sing a long verse in which the Kochinga motives takes up most of the lines, but the gods suddenly mention the spirits again, and the reference is unmistakable. The gods sing, look, she's saying build a large grill. This grill is a large wooden structure placed above, above a fire to roast and smoke game. The Arawete use it to smoke what they hunt and according to them, the spirits use it to roast the meat of their victims. Since the gods do not have any cul cul culinary skills, they eat raw or cook food in the sun, this line could refer to nothing else but the spirit's grill, the structure they use to roast Arawete meat. Compared to the spirit's speech, the god's song follows one single motive to depict a particular landscape. While the spirits describe different actions, movements and introduce different voices, such as the grandfather, the gods don't mention their own actions, but the, but the movements of a small bird which is associated with the spirit. Here we can see how the contracts be, contrast between the sonic characteristics of the two blocks, the fast spoken laughs and the melodic refrains, is also a contrast between the, sense, the scene of a hunting party in the spirits block and the landscape of small birds on the forest canopy. These two blocks, however, are also different in terms of the linguistic mechanism that, that they employ. The spirit speech frequently resort to the use of direct speech citations, while in the gods block, another speech only appears as a comment or glossy. While the spirits use iku, the gods use the particle pue, I'm sorry, the wrong thing, uh, in order to mention what the, ani is, what the spirits are saying. If the spirits mention everyone, the gods, the spirits, other spirits, the Arawete, through embedded citations, the gods never quote the spirit's speech directly. The verb pue is used here to report something that the spirits have said. The main action of the scene is the making of the large wooden grill to smoke and roast uh, meat. And the, the sentence is on the third person. It seems clear that we're not dealing here with direct speech sentence, but with some for, so, form of paraphrasing in which pue is the reporting verb. In other words, the spoken block of these songs uses embedded citation to add, add voices to the shaman's uttering of the spirit's speech. But the shaman's voicing of the gods 
song only briefly resort to another's voices, and when it does, it uses a form of paraphrasing. From a linguistic point of view, if I may, Iku is a marker that closes a citation, and Pue is, I believe, a reportative evidential particle. That is, in that, in contrast to Iku, may indicate the indirect speech. My question here is, is this distinction between Iku and Pue in any sense related to the Arawete's cultural understanding of what speaking and uttering is? Ultimately, can we divorce this analysis of reported speech practices from the way in which they seem to think about the notion of what human spirits and divinities are? This relationship between utterance and alterity, so to speak, is a major theme, as we all know, in the works of, of Mikhail Bakhtin. According to the first, language is inherently dialogical, embedded with alterity and characterized by a fundamental heteroglossia that prevents us from analyzing it as something solely univocal and closed. Voloshinov, who worked closely with Bakhtin, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm getting this wrong, but distinguishes between a linear style of reported speech in which the integrity of someone's discourse is kept and the identity of the utterer is played down, and a pictorial style in which that integrity is destroyed, and the utterer may color someone else's discourse with his or her own opinions. Focusing mainly on Russian, German, and French, he emphasizes how indirect speech is rare in the medieval forms of these languages, and how it emerges in the 19th century, along with a form of critical individualistic style that involves a several de debilitation of both the authoritarian and the rationalistic dog dogma dogmatism of utterance, eventually leading to the dissolution of the authorial con content context. On the same subject, he wrote, and I quote, when someone else's ideological discourse is internally persuasive for us and acknowledged by us, entirely different possibilities open up. Such discourse is of device decisive significance in the evolution of an individual consciousness. Consciousness awakens to independent ideological life, precisely in the world of alien discourses surrounding it, and from which it cannot initially separate itself. What Bakhtin is saying, I think, is that indirect speech is a tool for someone to emerge as an independent voice out of this myriad of voices that surround us. We can see how this question or problem that Bakhtin raises is somehow present in the description I have been giving of the other attest songs to capture spirits. The voices of others uttered by the shaman, voices that in themselves also refer to other voices. The gods quoted by a shaman spirit, cited by his grandson spirit, all of this uttered by a shaman. And what they are debating is precisely who is human who and who is not, who can be called prey and who can be called person. However, could we actually connect this with what Bakhtin is saying? Could we equate the difference between the, the use of iku and pu'e in a verbal art to the distinction between linear and pictorial styles of reported speech. At first, the division in two blocks in the Arete's songs seems to be a quite neat presentation of the opposition between direct and indirect speech. The spirits quoting their grandparents maintain, maintaining their speech in a linear style, while the gods singing the spirits' actions in a pictorial style that dissolves the spirits' authorial content. Uh, content, sorry. But this is strange. How could Bakhtin's analysis work in the Amazon? If anything, Bakhtin focuses on the relationship between the development of indirect speech and the emergence of modern-day modern individualistic ideology would prevent me from stating that the Pue form is a simple form of indirect reported speech. We shouldn't be able to separate their analysis from this particular moment in history where a conscious, creative writer is struggling to find her own voice. And yet, it's clear to me that Pua involves some sort of paraphrasing that is different from the most common form of reporting speech in the Arawetea language, the Iku. I started this talk with my next door neighbor, the Red Girl, and mentioned that she was attacked by the Anin spirits. Song 1, which I have presented here, was a revenge-like event in which a shaman, Radgal's father, set out to capture these spirits. In the process, he voices them and also voices the gods. 
thus presenting us with a unique interplay between different styles of singing, in fact, with the difference between speaking and singing, and more importantly for this talk, with different ways of conveying another's point of view through reported speech practices. In itself, it shows the values, I believe, of language documentation efforts to seek to collaborate with indigenous groups around the world in recording and translating such incredible examples of verbal artistry. The main question for me in this paper was, first, is the pu'e used by the gods to report the spirit's speech a form of indirect speech? I believe so, and following Bakhtin, it is perhaps linked to a specific, that is, an arayate way of thinking about what a person is. The concept of person, or the position of person, human or author, is ultimately in dispute. Several beings are capable of ascending to that position that says, this is me and I'm speaking, but the gods wish to hold this possibility away from the spirits. By not quoting them directly, they deny them the possibility of speaking as a person. The second question that I address here is perhaps a little bit more general, for it is the question whether, to, to, whether it is possible to understand uh, linguistic structure, in this case forms of reported speech, without taking into account how the speakers of a language, in this case the Arawete, conceptualize and, and think about it and practice it. The, the answer to the second question is, to me, still very difficult. I would suggest, however, that looking at, looking at the way in which people talk about and describe language, and also how they play and make art with it, can be a powerful tool to imagine the possibilities that languages can have. I hope that my paper has given you some food for this thought. But, this presentation's title does mention two songs, and so far I have only been talking about one. I'm aware that my time is ending, and unfortunately I won't be able to talk about this second song today. <coughs> song two, as I said, is a different spectacle. It concerns bringing back to life the Red Girl's stranded soul. It involves other spoken techniques. It's still a song, but one in which the relationship between names and things don't seem to add up. Add up. People call each other by the wrong names, creating refer referential havoc. As we know, words sometimes point to unusual reference, such as what this presentation has done, a presentation entitled Two Songs, but that only talked about one. Thank you. that you uh, also pointed out yourself, is how the interlocutors uh, handle these very different layers mm -hmm. uh, and indexes. And I was wondering, um, to what extent um, it would be helpful to look at this, these discourses in terms of voice footing and, mm -hmm. and registerment. Because clearly there must be some degree of conventionalization so that the hearers can recognize particular social personae, gods and spirits, grandfathers. So I, I wonder if you have something to say about that? Okay. Yes, that's a really good question, and, um, and of course, this dividing and analyzing of the layers was uh, only possible to be done in collaboration with Irado No and Yatumaru Arawete, who young adults who, uh, as I suppose happens, were not that interested at the beginning, but at the end of the field work, they were quite interested, uh, uh, and it was really hard for them. To, especially to it, I don't know, with whom I worked the most, uh, to work with me in the spirit speech. Right? As I played before, it's really fast and it's really difficult to, uh, 
to, to get and to understand what's being said. So he frequently wanted to, you know, let's just move on, let's just go back to, to the shaman singing because that's, that's what, right? And as I said, the music of the gods in most of these songs are just the second block, right? So it's just the melodic singing of the, of the, of the gods which and the deceased uh, kin, the deceased uh, that is the most common, the most popular form of, uh, of a lot of, this, of songs. And these, I found that people are incredibly aware of uh, the metaphors, the special languages being used, uh, the people that are there. So in none of these songs, the deceased that is actually being voiced by the shaman is mentioned, ever. And the whole thing about listening to them is how it's, 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 it's kind of a, of a game to try to find out who's actually singing, right? Because in these songs, uh, there's no, the song can only be sung once, right? So it's never sung again, nor by, this, by this, the same shaman, not by another one, sorry. And um, it's always a deceased Araweta who sings in these songs. And since the, in the village where I worked, there, was, there were four active uh, singers, they sang pretty much every other day from, from like 45 minutes to even three hours. And so it kind of creates this landscape where everyone's singing, but these songs are, of course, recorded and then reproduced, but never sung or presented again by the same shaman or by a different one, right? So every song is, in a sense, a new song. But people are usually really uh, used to the metaphors and the discourse in these songs. The, the spirit speech, the first block of these capture songs, are, as I said, uh, much harder. But in comparison to the songs and in comparison to the other big musical genre, the music of the enemies, they are f quite fixed. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, the lines, what's being said, uh, doesn't change that much from song to song. Mm -hmm. And these are songs that people don't like listening to them that much. And they happen at night, when everyone's sleeping, there's a very strict audience. It's usually the shaman and his helper, who's basically the guy that kills the spirits with the machete. And there's no, well, I mean, basically the guy because there's no formal training for that. It's just someone that goes with the shaman. And the occasional crazy linguist or ethnographer who's doing field work that goes around as well, right? So these, um, that's what I say. If they're much harder to listen and to understand, they are much more fixed than the other songs. Um, yeah, does that kind of address a little bit? A little bit, um, and maybe a follow-up. Um, so, so then it would make sense to say that these are voices and particular footings that have become unregistered to some extent, mm -hmm. so that the audience knows what to expect, and that helps interpretation. Mm -hmm. I was also wondering, when listening to the songs, clearly it was not just um, Morphosyntactic elements that differentiated the, the different blocks. Sure, sure. Um, but also rhythm and uh, voice quality. And I mean, we didn't see a video, but I would imagine that there may be other uh, parts of the interaction that yes, would yeah, differ. Yes, sure. Um, and so, in that sense, um, my question would be to what extent it's um, useful to focus only on linguistic elements mm -hmm. that set these. Mm -hmm. two uh, registers part. Sure, sure. No, yeah, I, I was, uh, so at the beginning, if you remember when I presented the, the difference between the last and the yeah. refrains, that is yeah. a, a, one of the ways of, I suppose, uh, coming out of the linguistic analysis and, and trying to think of what the means in, in which these blocks are different, right? Mm -hmm. So the main, um, so I suppose the w one way to start is by how the Araweta themselves describe these two blocks, mm -hmm. right? So one is described as a spoken block, right? So it's the verb to speak, they're characterized, and what, whereas the other one is a sung block, right? So that's why I've kind of been calling these speech songs, kind of, yeah? yeah? And the other, so it's, it's spoken, it has, got, it has uh, the laughs, it's very fast, and also it includes these uh, direct speech. So these are all kind of things that I try to keep together, although I have focused, of course, a bit more on that, on the linguistic bit uh, today. Uh, there is, of course, uh, in terms of gesture and movement, uh, 
the difference between two blocks is mainly indexed by the sound of the rattle. Yeah? So the way it, it sounds in this circular motion, very fast circular motion to capture the spirits, is very, while, he's, while the shaman is standing, is very different from the way that it sounds when he's crouching down and singing and just beating the rattle in his arm. So I try to, uh, but yes, definitely, I mean, there's, there's, there's a, things that, that, that uh, have to go together. Maybe I should give somebody else a chance. Um, you said that these songs are never repeated. So how do they feel about you recording them and playing them? Oh, they're fine. They're fine, right? So one of the, the other things about Aravata shamanism mainly, uh, which is the difference between the other genre in which the songs can be repeated, but this genre, the songs are thought of as belonging to the deceased and the spirits that are being voiced. Yeah? So, so, so from the Aravates point of view, the songs are, the songs are not theirs. Mm -hmm. yeah? So when I ask them about to record them, they're like, that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's fine, but those songs, they're just like, that's fine, it's not mine. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 right? So it's for this in... And they were fine. The, the only uh, song that was more difficult, but not in terms of recording, but in terms of uh, listening to, is the healing songs. But that, only for the person who had been ill and whose voice or whose soul was being, being, being voiced by the shaman in the song. So that, of course, created a discomfort for the person to hear her own soul being voiced by a different uh, way of shaman, right? So that created a difficulty for her to listen. But uh, not only me, and the reason why I became, so I didn't go to the other Aratea to study their songs at first, but the reason I became interested is because the Aratea themselves record and play and listen, in, listen to their own songs all the time. Mm -hmm. All the time. Yeah? Um, they had been doing this with uh, cassette recorders before, but these days they have, you've probably seen them in, in different places, but the small uh, radio, battery radios, which of course in the village don't, uh, you have no, no radio except for one broadband radio from, from Brasilia, broadcast of the official government radio. There's no local radios that you can capture, right? So you, what you do is just insert a flash, uh, flash drive and then you play these songs. And these radios, they, are, they act as recorders as well. So they record and listen to these songs all the time. Um, yeah. Um, you talked um, about the orchestra and the and the next sort of stuff. Um, yeah. And about, I was just wondering about the, the general um, beliefs about language and about um, kind of, you, you sort of mentioned about who counts as, what counts as human. Sure. Um, and I just wonder whether you could say a little bit more about the beliefs about language for the other way to okay. to okay. humanity. And, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, like, that's a great question. and. Um, of course, Virgil Castro's theory is this general theory about humans, gods, and plants, and animals uh, trying to put together a lot of different and very complex uh, Amerindian traditions. Yeah. So what you will have uh, for different groups is what that it's not this general belief or this, this pan-humanity where anything is human and anything goes. It's not like that does it sound, it's way more specific than that, right? Good. So for example, uh, apart from gods, the Mai, which are fundamental to the Eraita, they are, they turn into them when they die. These are cannibal gods, right? So they eat the, the deceased Eraita and then make them people again. The gods actually speak and sing and then they share they share with uh, the Eroite this sense of being human, this sense of being us, right? So what's, and that's perhaps the most interesting thing in terms of perspectivism is that the word for people in a lot of places in Amazonia is uh, the word for us, 
Yeah? So it's the pronoun for us. So that's why he calls it uh, pronominal, well, cosmological pronouns, or if you wish, pronominal cosmologies, right? So well, it that's is. That's why I was lost with one, two, three. I was wondering exactly. about that. Yes, thing. exactly. Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. here, right? So what I translate as not people, mm -hmm. uh, you could translate as not us mm -hmm. as well. Yeah? Uh, but what, what's, it, what's interesting is that spirits use the same word to say us. So the gods use the same words to say us. We say the same words to say us. And that's my point in saying that who's actually human is in dispute. Yeah? And there's a lot of interesting th stuff in terms of kinship in Amazonia, for example, <coughs> on how you have to transform babies into humans. Yeah? So, so babies are not born. Humans meaning here a specific humanity, right? So you have to transform babies into a specific arawete. And that involves body techniques, right? And involves, I wish I had brought up a, a video of, a, of, a, of the midwife, actually, you know, making the babies like a newborn after two hours, making it round and then stretching his skin, shaving eyebrows and all that two or three hours after birth, right? So it's this effort to make them uh, be and look and have a body that is Arawete, meaning human. But uh, what's also interesting is that apart from gods and divinities in the case of the Arawete, you also have enemies. Right? So as I, as I was telling you before we started, the, the second imp most important genre is music that you learn from people that you've killed. Yeah? So these victims, the victim's double or soul travels to the end of the world and comes back, wakes you up, Te teaches you songs, and these songs you have to perform, right? These songs are completely different. They're not sung by a shaman, they're sung by a group in a large beer drinking party. They have a completely different structure. But again, uh, these, so the idea of, uh, of being people and being, being enemy, they, they're kind of, they kind of shift as well, right? And uh, what's interesting in the case of the Arawete is that it, this idea of humanity does not apply to <coughs> in general to all humans, right? So although you have one important mythical narrative that, or, or narrative about speciation, right? So about the time in which humans and animals spoke the same language or had the same body, the same visible body. Uh, although you have several, several animals listed there, what seems to be important to them is, is the ability to sing. Yeah? So you have very few uh, enemies and, and here the category of animals and enemies is conflated, right? Because every time you kill uh, a howler monkey, a big howler monkey, a capuchin monkey, a jaguar, you have to, you have to sing as well, right? So they are victims of warfare, not of hunting. But that does not apply to fish, it doesn't apply, apply to peccaries. That's what I mean, right? So it's not just this general animals are all humans, not really, right? This is here. and of course, in the case you have more very common uh, ideas, such as a jaguar, which is perhaps one of the most important animals in terms of cosmology in Amazonia, but also in terms of the, uh, the howling monkey, right? The, just the simple uh, waking up in the morning or late in the afternoon when they're singing as well, right? And then you have sorts of different comments, right? So stuff like how the howling, the howling monkeys, they have their own drinking parties and they have their own fights and this, all these descriptions that sometimes you get through the song, sometimes you don't. So I have a few songs about how, uh, the sung from the uh, howler monkey's victim, uh, or I mean a human victim, uh, that are about uh, the macaws. Right? So he's talking about the macaws and a kinship about the macaws. So it's this very beautiful uh, play or, or verbal art in which human, humans are together in a block singing songs from a howler monkey's, howler monkey's point of view, talking about Mako kinship. Yeah? So you see how all these things kind of come together, right? So uh, does that make sense? Yeah. And yeah. So, and so like these, is this kind of suggesting that sort of along the same type of lines with the difference between the Nikko and the uh, uh, Pueh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, the problem is the problem is that I have again, as I said, I'm not, I'm, I'm not I haven't been trained as a linguist, you know, although I certainly would have wanted to. But you know, life happens, uh, children and stuff. Uh, but 
Um, and it's very unfortunate that the linguists that have worked, although with the Arawat language, didn't uh, focus on reported speech. I mean, it's very unfortunate to me, right? I mean, they, they're doing their job, and I, they don't. It's, you can never do everything, right? But uh, so it seems quite clear in the case of Iku that it is the direct speech, right? So it's easy to, and it's very straightforward the translations in terms of like this being a verbatim citation, right? Then here you have the quotative, and here usually. Right, so like the other simple or kind of simple example, I suppose. Right, so it's, I will go, uh, said he, she, or them. Right, this is like everyday stuff in the morning with people trying to organize what they do and, uh, during the day. They go ask someone and then it comes back and it's like, you know, I will go, said grandfather, said uncle, said grandma, said my dad. Yeah, all these, so it seems quite okay. My, my personal uh, difficulty and stuff is with the pui. Right? Here. Right? So, uh, this, is, this is the grill, the big grill to make, and they continue with the same to make. This is these right side uh, third person verbs are quite common in the songs, and I've, 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 it's very difficult for me to analyze them sometimes, what they actually mean. They don't seem to actually have much influence in the sentence sometimes in all of the songs, not just here. Uh, then you ha here you have something important, as, which is a, a topicalizer, or as a focus, right? And kind of highlights this bit here, right? So they continue, they, they, they're saying, they continue to say, or she's saying something, which seems to, be, to me to be a form of paraphrase. The problem is that, uh, because of Bacton, I suppose, uh, it seems too, too neat, yeah? And it's weird that Baxton should work in the Amazon, to me. Right? Maybe it's not, but to me it is. Uh, and, and usually, now it's starting to change. I mean, there's been some work with Matzes, with David Fleck. He's a very important linguist who has been working with Matzes for 30 years, I think. Uh, and he used to say that there's no such a thing other than direct speech in Amazonia and with Moses. And he came out with some of the people saying about four years ago with the paper saying, well, maybe actually here there's stuff. Yeah, there's, there's paraphrasing, there's no actually change in person. So, right? Mm -hmm. So you get these, these things. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. This is just, it reminds me of a beautiful talk by Hein van der Ford. I need to look up the language, but okay. the language is spoken in Para. Oh, okay. uh, no, Rondonia, sorry. Yeah. Uh, as it would be. And uh, where he is actually looking at, not at the language itself, but at the Portuguese spoken. Right, right, people. of course. And he says they have always been chastised for making a grammatical error in the verb conjugation in Portuguese, but he has actually analyzed it as a form, as a quotative. Right. So superficially, it looks as if they are making a grammatical error, but it is actually a grammatical distinction that they have introduced into Portuguese because it exists hmm. in their hmm. language. Hmm. I can, I can find yeah, out yeah, more definitely. for you. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I just, uh, it's so that's that's the thing. That's my my thing with the poor I suppose. Yeah. Is it indirect speech? Is it not? Uh, yeah. yeah. Please. So is this being? Do you notice this being used more to refer to the speech of the gods than the, the equal, or is there not really a clear Right, yeah, that is a very good question, right? So, as I said, you have the music of the gods, which mainly is shamans bringing deceased and gods to sing, right? And it's, the, it sounds like the second block of these songs, right? So these songs, the spirit capturing songs, they're like a subset of the music of the gods. They have the music of the gods on one block, and they have the spoken block at the other one. So the music of the gods in general, they use a lot of equal, and a lot of the, the, the other forms, uh, which seem they're much more common in singing than, uh, than in, in daily conversations, right? So dare, de, dao, they are very common, right? But here, and that is the crazy thing, the songs of the gods in this spirit capturing songs have no ego at all. Right? It's completely absent. So it's really striking from when you compare to the whole, it's like this is, yeah. this is unusual. Yeah? So it's kind of moved to the spoken block. 
And here you have the Pue. Right? So, uh, the, I have a few examples of Pue. This is the most difficult one and the one that I brought because the one that seems to be paraphrasing. I have some which are clearly direct speech as well with the Pue. So it's, but it's inverted. So instead of the verbatim coming before, it comes after. So it's Pue, blah, 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 blah. And that's considered uh, verbatim. Yeah? But not here. And there are very few uh, of these examples. And it's, it was a bit of a struggle to kind of, uh, to, to actually find what they could mean. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I'm just wondering as well, like, how it interacts with the different modalities, you know, singing and speaking, whether singing is, um, has more connotations of kind of the divine or, you know, in sure, sort of surely a trans-like does. state. Like surely does. does. Whether that impacts on the kinds of Quotatives that are being used, yeah, whether you're referring yeah. to utterance or physical speech. You know, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Really yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's the most striking thing because I would expect that in the singing there would be a lot of quotatives, mm -hmm. but in this case there is. There's okay. these top types of glossing and paraphrasing, mm -hmm. right? and that's quite unusual. Mm -hmm. That makes it really interesting as well. And my kind of connection or my way of, of thinking about it was to think uh, what seems to be in dispute here or it seems to be in debate or in, you know, is this problem of who's human, who's not, who's people and who's not, yeah. So this, this seems to be what, what this thing is going. And what seems to, to be happening is that, look, the gods are not allowing the spirits to to speak, actually, not quoting them, not, not allowing them to, to act as a speaker or as a full speaker, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because in the end, right, so there's this whole thing, so the spirits are saying, no, because nah, the gods are not people, and they're kind of bragging and all that. So when I talked to the other, I was like, well, but would they actually kill the gods? And they're like, oh, no, they could have to do that. That's just silly, right? So there's this, so the overall kind of, uh, sometimes they do escape. And that is amazing, right? So it's an amazing thing when they escape. It's quite rare, but the spirits do escape. Yeah? So they just, the shaman just runs out, just like going, woo, 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 woo. And the spirits just go somewhere. Right? And then you have to hunt, go run, run after him with your recorder at 3 a.m. Yeah? Uh, but um, but they, they are killed, right? So they, they're killed all the and that's the whole point of the thing, yeah. So it's, it's this alliance between the Eretan and the gods to hunt these guys and keep them away. And um, yeah, it's one of the, it's incredible. It's, it's uh, yeah, a lot of, of, of deaths amongst the Eretan are, are caused by these, these spirits and the, the piercing of, of people. Uh, yeah. Well, tonight was almost up and maybe to continue this discussion sure. over a beer in the <laughs> lovely summer afternoon while it lasts. So let's thank you very much. Thanks so much. No, thank you. Thank you.